to have another video link uh, with uh, David Britt, who uh, unfortunately his passport uh, didn't allow him to come here, although he had, a, he had a passport. You have to have six months on your passport these days, so watch that in the future. I've also been caught out on that one, and uh, they wouldn't let him on the plane. But um, uh, he's very kindly uh, going to talk to us. So he's the first, he was really the second speaker this morning, but he's going to give us his lecture remotely, like Victor uh, Batista did yesterday. So that's marvelous. That's marvelous, and it's live. So we can ask him some questions afterwards. David, we're going to go over to you now, David. Up, off you go. Okay, I think I said I can start now, so let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, Jim, I really appreciate your inviting me to this uh, special meeting, and I'm sorry I messed up with the whole six-month passport thing. I feel a little dumb about that, but uh, with that said, let's, uh, let's dive right in. So uh, I'm going to talk about... Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, you can. There was a, a blank then. So I don't know if you're using a microphone, but don't move it away from the microphone. Yeah, I'm using the I'm using the microphone in the computer, which usually works. Okay, it's working fine. Okay, well let me let's try to start here. Um, so um, we're interested in using Pulse DPR, as the title said, to look at substrate and substrate analog binding. And of course, as a uh, As has been uh, no doubt discussed in detail, one of the challenges in the uh, OEC is that the uh, uh -oh, wait, I'm having a little problem here. David, oh, yeah. we lost your sound. We lost the sound. Are you moving around or something? We got no sound from you. We can't oh, hear you. I see you. it now. Okay. So uh, one of the issues with the OEC is that the substrate water for the oxygen evolution is also the, the solvent. And so that means that even though we have nice structures, it's still not a priori completely clear what the uh, substrate oxygens are. So... Uh, and this is important because, again, as I'm sure has been discussed much, the different in vogue mechanistic models invoke different potential substrate oxygens. So for this reason, uh, it's useful, in addition to looking at waters, to employ water analogs and inhibitors, which have been done for many years by many people in, in the room there in Singapore. So. Uh, so that includes, for example, small alcohols as well as amines. Uh, I guess I'm not, can everybody hear me fine still? Yes, we can hear you very well. OK, great. All right, I'll just dive in now. So uh, of course, there's been huge progress in this in x-ray crystallography, including the uh, serial XFEL studies. Uh, one thing I want to point out is in con contrast between magnetic resonance and X-ray spectroscopy and diffraction is the X-ray methods are basically only looking at electron density. So you don't have different nuclear isotopes to exploit the way we do in magnetic resonance. Uh, you know, I guess if only the muon could be stabilized, you'd have something like an isotope for the electron. But as it is, you don't. And uh, particularly when you're looking, for example, at comparing, for example, water to ammonia, the effect that the electron density until you get to really high resolution is, is very similar. And this is very different for EPR and other magnetic resonances because we have the isotopes. So for example, for water, we have the non-magnetic O16, but we can substitute with O17. If we're looking at, say, methanol, we've got non-magnetic carbon-12, but we can put in carbon-13, spin a half. For nitrogen, like the ammonia studies, we have two isotopes, N14 and N15, that are both magnetic. And then, of course, for protons and deuterons, for hydrogen, we have two good targets there as well. And uh, 
So what we're going to do in EPR and pulse DPR is look at the magnetic coupling between the electrons, in this case localized on the manganese ions of the OEC, and these various nuclear spins, and that, of course, is what we term the hyperfine interaction. And I think we probably all know that we lost one of the great people in our field recently. George Fair passed away a couple of months ago. And I know when I started graduate school, one of the things that, that George David. said that David. inspired me was there was a George quote that there's nothing in nature more definitive than the hyperfine interaction. So that seemed like as a, a young student working with Mel Klein, like that might be a good thing to go after with George saying that. So um, we have these nuclear isotopes that have magnetic moment. The ones that are spin greater than a half, like for example, N14, I show here in orange, they have an additional interaction that will be useful here called the nuclear electric quadrupole interaction. So we're going to look at that specifically for N14. OK, so the thing that's nice about pulse DPR in the modern world is that even for complex systems like PS2, we can often use pulse DPR to look at a single spin or in a single atom, a single nuclear spin. So obviously, we have this enormous photosystem 2 structure. How do we do this? Well, one is by the very nature of the pulse DPR, we focus on magnetic nuclei that are close, very close to a specific paramagnet that's giving rise to an EPR signal. We can also refine things by using specific isotopes. And then we can tune in for specific kinds of couplings using different pulse sequences, microwave frequencies, pulse parameters, et cetera. And we're well equipped at Davis for doing that sort of thing. So let me just talk real quickly about a couple of techniques because uh, the complementary of these might be useful in the talk. So the first thing I ever did was this uh, spin echo envelope modulation experiment. This is a cartoon from uh, Bill Rutherford, one of his papers. And the idea here is you have hard, short microwave pulses that flip the electron spins, but they also, under certain con conditions, can flip nuclei along with them. And that helps you build up a coherent state of nuclei coupled to the electron spins. And those give rise to beats when you do the changing the timing. And so you get this so-called envelope modulation, which um, then you can pull out the frequencies with Fourier transforms. So the traditional methods are there two pulse and three pulse, one-dimensional experiments. And you can also do a variant of a three pulse eSIM in an experiment we call high score, where you add another pi pulse, and that gives you two different timing dimensions. So you can do t 2D plots, sort of like the NMR people do all the time. So I want to show you an example or two of these. And uh, you know, in the big picture of sustainability and photosynthesis, the other part besides splitting water is making a fuel. And so we also work a lot. I don't think there's a lot of talks about this at the meeting, but we will work a lot on the hydrogenases. And particularly, we're working a lot on the assembly of these. And they're particularly interesting because the hydrogenases, this is the iron-iron hydrogenase. They have these organometallic elements. So for example, cyanide and carbon monoxide bound to iron in the active site. So one of the things we've been doing is, uh, I'm just going to spend a minute to tell people about how we use pulse DPR here. Um, we're interested in how these are assembled. And the, what's interesting is the cyanide and the carbon monoxide come from tyrosine. And there's an enzyme, it's in the family of uh, radical SAM enzymes, we call HIG, that lyses tyrosine. And uh, in our model, the cyanide and CO initially bind to a fifth, a fifth iron, that we, call, we actually call the dangler iron, because once you have dangler manganese, you just want to keep going. And here's an example of a high school where when we have natural abundance HIG, we just see some low frequency peaks that are probably from N14 in the protein. But if we add the spin a half iron 57, we get a nice doublet. It's weakly coupled because once the cyanide and the CO are bound, this is diamagnetic. But we can pull that out with the high score and using specific isotopes, we unambiguously see that. We can also do uh, another experiment called indoor. So in indoor, it's a pulsed experiment where Instead of using the semi-forbidden transitions, we drive NMR pulses with RF coils and high-power pulses. So the physics here is completely different. So in that sense, it's complementary to ESIM and high score. 
And I'll show you a couple examples of that. Uh, if we run this reaction, lysine tyrosine with a carbon 13 in the one position, that specifically goes on the carbon monoxide. And we see it with indoor, a weakly coupled doublet from that specific carbon. If we use the 2C13 tyrosine, the carbon goes into the cyanide. We see another weakly coupled doublet split about the same. And then we've argued that cysteine forms the rest of the chelation from iron. And if we use this label in the cysteine, we see a more strongly coupled doublet again in the indoor. So this is the kind of thing we like to do, use pulse DPR techniques and do specific isotope experiments whenever possible. Uh, this is in press in Nature Chemistry, so that should be out, I think, in the next issue. So let's go back to PS2, which is what we want to talk about. And uh, basically, I want to start with ammonia, because ammonia has been in a little bit of a renaissance lately. And it really starts with this paper from the Muheim group, Navarro et al., that was in PNES several years ago. And uh, in this work, one of the things interesting, in addition to the pulse DPR, they use this technique called electron um, Eldor detected NMR. I'm going to talk about that some in a little bit. To look at O17, which the Milheim group's done quite effectively using this technique. But uh, Johannes worked with them on the mass spec. And one of the uh, things that came out of this in a careful study is that Ammonia appears to bind at a non-substrate site. So when we have all these different potential substrates, if we can show where ammonia is binding, we can rule out one and possibly rule out a mechanism. So this uh, gets to some of Gary's work with Victor and uh, David Vineyard in this paper, actually, uh, where they propose that perhaps the ammonia is bound in this famous O5 site. And they have several arguments for that. And one was going back to some of our original work doing pulse DPR, where we looked at N14, which is spin one, so it has a quadrupole moment. Normally, ammonia would have a very axial electric field gradient, and so it would have a very high symmetry and a low what's called asymmetry parameter. But when I did this back in grad school, this is actually the first pulse DPR paper on the OEC, we saw a very asymmetric environment. And one possibility for that was the ammonia was no longer a ammonia, NH3. It could be deprotonated, and that was lowering the symmetry. And so uh, in this paper, they argued that perhaps that site was here, this O5. And the reason that's important, if ammonia was binding here, given this result, that would really uh, hinder the current version of, of Pear's model or would hinder pairs, would, would argue against pairs model, I should say. So, um, so we sat out to look at this in more detail, working with Rick. And specifically, there had been a paper by uh, my friend Martin Kelp that had noted with DFT that perhaps this specific hydrogen bond could break the symmetry enough to get this asymmetric quadrupolar interaction at a nitrogen 14 here. And so working with Rick, we first had to characterize the mutants where we put alanine instead of aspartate. Those gave good multilines. I'll show a little bit of that in detail, but let's just go to the, the final point of the paper, really, uh, which is looking at this uh, spinacle envelope modulation with the N15 isotope of nitrogen and ammonia. Of course, we've done the N15 to know it's an ammonia coupling. And uh, what you see both in a spinach wild type, this is a time domain ESIM pattern, take the Fourier transform. At low frequencies, you see the nuclear quadrupole interaction resolve itself very well. There are three peaks here. You see the same peaks basically if you do it in synthesis, where Rick can do the mutations. And so the idea is what happens to this, these three peaks that are split out quite a bit because of a rhombic electric quadrupole interaction, which we parameterize with this parameter eta. The prediction is if that's caused by this, uh, this hydrogen bond, if we delete that hydrogen bond, the field gradient should be sort of more symmetric. And that's exactly what happened. So when we deleted, the, when Rick made the alanine mutant, we see that these two peaks become much closer. This peak goes to lower frequencies. That's characteristic of a higher symmetry. And this parameter that we use to characterize it drops by a factor of 10. 
So it's a much more axial environment for that ammonia, consistent with this model that the ammonia is bound here, coupled to this hydrogen bond that Rick deleted. At the same time, the hyperfine interactions are unchanged, basically. And even the magnitude of the quadrupolar interactions hardly changed at all. It's very small change. It's just the symmetry of it. So that's exactly what we expected if ammonia was bound here and we we're affecting the symmetry by deleting that hydrogen bond. So that led us to conclude to agree with the Mulheim group, uh, Wolfgang's group, that it's the W1 site at the S2 state where ammonia binds. Of course, it's not bound at all at S1. And uh, so this leaves the one argument against the O5 substrate, it leaves that viable as Pear would certainly uh, tell us he always knew. And it doesn't really knock out the other model because the W2 is still here, even though W1's gone, the W2 is still here. So I don't think it's conclusive. It's more like it leaves the radical coupling model viable, of course. So what we've been doing more recently is diving in a little deeper. And we published a paper here comparing ammonia and, and control samples at the S2 state. So we have a new paper, David Marchiora, that just came out in a JFIS Kim B. So I want to talk about a few aspects of that, and also some of the other stuff that's in the original Oyala paper. And one is the manganese 55 indoor. So uh, if you look at the multi-line signal, as we all call it, for the S2 state, you see about 18 or 19 lines. But that's just a hint of what's really going on, because if you've got four coupled manganese 55, each is spin five halves, there are actually almost 1,300 transitions buried in that line shape. So the only way to really get at what's going with the hyperfine couplings unambiguously is to do the indoor, which we first did 20 years ago, and of course the Mulheim group's done quite a bit of. So here's a comparison in spinach and in wild-type synthesis, as well as Rick's alanine mutant, of what the couplings to the individual manganese are, with and without ammonia. And the point is that even though there are subtle changes in the EPR line shape, as Gary first showed many, many years ago, there's really not much change in the hyperfine coupling to each of the individual manganese. Basically, it doesn't take much of a hyperfine coupling change as we monitor in the indoor here to affect the sort of coherence, the constructive, destructive interference as you look at all these lines building up in the multi-line signal. So it's really a lot better to do the indoor where each class of manganese 55 has a finite number of transitions. And we see that there's really not much change going from a non-ammonia to ammonia bound. The other thing is we have one intrinsic really nice reporter of the spin density, which is the histidine 332 with the nitrogen 14 here. And we see this better doing ESIM at fairly high frequency. There's this idea of matching in ESIM that some of you may know about. But uh, we resolve very nicely at Q-band ESIM, this N14 coupling. And now we can look at it. So here we've got a point at this manganese 1 across from where the ammonia is. And we see that when ammonia is bound or not, there's really no change in this coupling. So the spin density on this manganese is not affected by ammonia binding, et cetera. Then there's always the issue of protons and exchangeable protons. And I showed this um, because Jim was so kind to invite me to this meeting. I wanted to show this, this paper that we uh, wrote in conjunction with a very nice meeting that Jim had us out to at the Royal Society. And this is the first time we tried to do a robust simulation of indoor and the e scene for deuteron exchanged OEC at the S2 state. And uh, this was, of course, before we had an X-ray structure, and it was also at fairly low frequency for the indoor compared to now. But let's revisit this now. This is what we published in this recent JFIS Chem paper. So we can do the proton indoor before D2O exchange and after D2O exchange, and it's only going to be the non-exchangeable protons, of course, left after the exchange. But now we have structures, and particularly we're using the DFT-based structure from Wilhelm, this low Miller et al. paper, to give us the ordinance for S2. That helps us figure out, along with the manganese 55 couplings, what the 
the dipolar coupling to each of these hydrogens are. We don't know the isotropic coupling, but we use that as something we vary. And so here's our fits without ammonia and with ammonia for both the, the all the protons and then also the ones that remain after D2O exchange. And they look quite similar. We don't see a big difference with and without ammonia. We can look into exchangeable ones using the complementary method of ESIM. And we see pretty similar deuter. This is now we're looking at the deuterons, and we're ratioing the deuteron spectrum from the proton spectrum in order to isolate the effects of the deuterons and cancel out nitrogen 14 modulation. It's just a little bit deeper with ammonia, which is consistent of having one more proton on ammonia in the W1 site. And uh, we can do simulations, and they look pretty good. There's a little DC offset here that I think comes from just a small difference in the relaxation when the OEC is exposed to deuterons versus protons. But we're really looking at how quickly this modulation damps. In this case, the control without ammonia, this case with ammonia. And the damping and the modulation depth looks pretty good with that model. So as, as you know, that uh, the Yale group, Gary and Victor, have come up with an alternative model that they call the carousel. So here's what we might call the direct displacement where ammonia displaces W1. But the other possibility is that it adds an addition to W1 and W2. So this model was based, built upon QM image studies based on the analysis of the electron density from X-ray structures and also uh, XFs. So the question is then, uh, since magnetic resonance didn't seem to be part of the construction of the model, we now have this model and we can ask the question, how well does it predict the magnetic resonance results? And there are a few differences here. So for example, we now we break this up. Uh, what we're basically going to is we're shifting in the carousel model from this open configuration, as the Milheim group calls it, to this closed configuration. And of course, one aspect Back to that that's pretty interesting is in their modern interpretation, this form is giving rise to the G4.1 signal, which is a spin five half form, and this form is a spin a half. There's also additional exchangeable hydrogens here because we have a whole nother water and we also potentially protonate this O5 bridge. So there should be more exchangeable hydrogens in the site. So when we look at all the things we've measured, to us, the direct displacement model looks pretty good. It's still a spin a half state, which the direct displacement model would suggest. The carousel model, because you basically do this conversion to this closed cubane form here, it's really going to disrupt the pattern of change couplings between all these ions. And again, if, if this is a, a guide to it, it's questionable whether this would still be because if you change the exchange change, you'd affect the effective spin couplings to the different manganese nuclei drastically, even if you didn't change the spin state. We don't see that it fits with it. Maybe that could work with the carousel, but it's not so obvious to me. The other thing is this reporter, the histidine 332, where we have have uh, intrinsically 14 of that histidine, it doesn't change at all. It's completely the same for ammonia and control. And I don't see how that happens if you do such a drastic core rearrangement as the carousel predicts. And then finally, in our, in our view, the couplings to exchangeable protons and deuterons is pretty similar with and without ammonia, just a little deeper modulation. And uh, that's not what the carousel model predicts. So. Uh, we're not leaning to being being too supportive of that model. We still like the direct displacement, which is the take home of that uh, recent paper. But what we all really need to do is keep going farther and, and for example, getting to the S3 state. And uh, this is kind of a problem because uh, you run into a wall here, which I think everybody understands is that EPR works better when you have an odd number of electrons. And so just like S1, S3 will have an even number of electrons. 
And here, just looking at a simple level diagram for a spin one case, like triplet case, if you're at fairly low microwave fields, the APR frequencies are dominated by the zero field splittings that you have uh, when you have a so-called non-Kramer's integer spin model. But sometimes if you go to high enough frequency, you can get really beautiful data. And for, for example, for chlorophyll triplets, here's the chlorophyll triplet spectra from Bill Rutherford some years ago. This is exactly what you, what you want to see. This is when the zero field splittings are, are perturbation on the Zeeman fields. Okay. How much time do I have? Well, about five minutes. Okay, perfect. About Thank five you. minutes. So right through but, in this will was, you take was a few questions? Will you, uh, Dave, with, you'll take uh, a few questions? So here's a nice paper in Jack's in, in 209 from Elan and Bill, et, et cetera, where they showed a very broad, must have been quite a challenge to detect this. Look how wide it is. S3 signal that they could simulate as a spin three state. Now this was done at nine gigahertz X band. So another breakthrough was when Alan teamed up with uh, Nick Cox and Wolfgang and looked at this same signal at higher frequency at W band, going up a factor of ten. And look at this; it's beautiful. They published this in Science. Uh, you see all these transitions, much like that chlorophyll triplet I just showed from Bill. This is where you want to be, and you can see all six different manifold transitions. The zero field splitting is fairly small, which is an important part of the paper because they argue that all the manganese are six coordinate, and part of the argument in this paper is that there's another water binding to manganese at the S3 transition. So that's uh, part of why this is in science. So we've been working to go to higher frequency because unless you can go to high frequency, you're not going to be doing S3 effectively to do all the pulse stuff. So here's our home build 130 gigahertz instrument. Uh, it has four different channels, so we can do multiple frequency experiments. I'll show you an example of that. Uh, when you go to high frequency, the EPR tubes get really small if you're still using a cavity. So here's a American penny. Uh, and here's the size of the tube. And that's important because if you want to use high concentration samples, you don't get a lot of penetration depth. So we can still use pretty high concentration samples and do flash studies in these tiny tubes. So I just want to show you this. This is the difference between a one flash S2 at 130 gigahertz and this S3 integer spin signal. This is the multi line. At, at 130 gigahertz, it's Pretty interesting. The you know the manganese hyperfine that makes it look relatively broad at X band doesn't change when you go to higher frequency. And here we've got 13 times higher the electron Zeeman frequency. So we get a nice little narrow, relatively narrow Gaussian at high field. This is easy to work with. This little gap here is where the tyrosine D is. So we actually have the peak of this is clear of the underlying tyrosine, which is not the case at X band. And then you see, even though this is a better behaved signal, this spin three signal at uh, 130 gigahertz or, or even at W band like Nick shows, it's still quite broad compared to S2 because the zero field splittings are large. So uh, we basically can simulate this with the similar parameters that Nick had at a slightly lower frequency. I think his signal noise is better than what we've gotten so far, but we're working on that. This is a little bit of manganese too, and here's the tyrosine D signal. And now we can also do this because we have multiple frequencies. We can do this for the first time. We can do this Eldor detected NMR that Nick and others in Mulheim have so effectively exploited. We have one frequency makes this many turn pulse called the high turning angle pulse. We sweep that frequency relative to this frequency. That makes it an electron electron double resonance experiment. And we can measure essentially the indoor transitions in that completely different way using two microwave frequencies and no RF frequency. And we get basically the same results that Nick got for S3. Here's uh, simulations based on his data. There are two strongly coupled manganese. There's more weakly coupled manganese. Here we see these different transitions. This is protons that move to higher frequency as we go to higher field looking at the different transitions. Uh, some of these are double quantum peaks, like this one. This is like twice that one, et cetera. But it all looks very consistent. So we're happy with this. We're kind of in the game now to do it S3, what 
we've been doing for many years in S2. Uh, again, you're not going to be able to do this in S3 robustly unless you have high field EPR. Finally, I wanted to show you a hint of what I think the future is. We're building a twice the frequency now. We're building a 263 gigahertz. And one aspect of this is uh, there's a, a technology gap. Sometimes it's called the terahertz gap when you get up above about 100 gigahertz, where conventional microwaves technology doesn't give you very high power. So we're building this with horns and mirrors and stuff. It's called the quasi-optic regime. But the real key part of this instrument is this guy, which is a high power traveling wave tube amplifier. And the way I like to look at this is, uh, this is like the poor man, well, maybe not that poor, but not rich man's version of the free electron laser. So uh, we all see these beautiful papers from Japan and, and Stanford and in Germany using the XFELs. If you scale that down, you can actually, instead of making X-rays, you can have electron beams going through oscillating magnets like an undulator that get you into the terahertz regime. So this is what we're trying to do with a, a group at Davis headed by Neville Luhmann in uh, electrical engineering. So here are the components. Here's the assembled device. It's been baked and heated for like a month to get all to get super high vacuum in it. So it doesn't look quite as pretty after it's been baked. Uh, Diana Gamzina, who's now working at Slack, built the thing. And right now we're trying to get it to work properly. So the problem with this is the electron beam has to travel through about a hundred micron zone under vacuum and not hit any of the copper. And so it didn't work at first. And they figured out the problem was that the magnet array here, which they had built built by another company, wasn't really quite up to their specs. And so we're getting this rebuilt, and hopefully when that's done, we'll be able to get high power and go off and look at S2 and S3 at even higher frequencies, higher power. So I think that's our, our future in this business for us. So uh, with that, let me thank all the people that we work with. Of course, a long time we've worked with both Rick Debus and Rob Burnap for the S3 work. We did some work with Petra using the thermophilic cyanobacteria, just like Nick had used. Uh, Troy Steak from my lab has long worked on PS2. There's interesting news for Troy today because he just accepted a faculty job at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. Uh, I'm particularly happy with that because my dad went to Wake Forest back in like 1939. Uh, he had to leave because he had this all expense paid tour of islands in the Pacific in the early 40s. But you know, one thing is I don't think he needed a passport. So that worked out. Uh, Lizzie Tao is working on PS2. She's done a lot of manganese oxidation using these multi-copper multi oxidase enzymes. David Marchior is a student who's been doing most of the recent works. So I want to particularly acknowledge him. And Paul Oyala, who got this latest ammonia started. And Paul's now at Caltech working with their pulse DPR, working with Teo. So you'll hear probably from Teo a little bit about some of Paul's recent work at Caltech. And finally, the nature chemistry on the hydrogenase is done by a postdoc, Guodong Rao. And that all got started with Dan Suez, who's left the lab to take a position on the faculty at MIT. And basically, that's what I wanted to tell you guys. Thank you. David, can you hear me? <coughs> David, can you hear me? David, uh, can you hear me? Just a little bit. It kind of <coughs> David, out. can you hear me? David, can yep. you hear me better? A little bit, Jim. I can hear you there. OK. The, uh, David, that was a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous talk. Uh, congratulations. Thank you, Thank you so much uh, for doing it for us. It was absolutely well, I appreciate you letting me Skype in. Uh, absolutely outstanding. Now, I'm not really the chairman. Your friend Gary Brookvick is the chairman. So I'm going to hand it over to Gary now, OK? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wonderful. OK, well, um, I'm, Dave, can you? Try to answer some questions? I can try. I can hear you pretty well. OK, well, yeah, I think you have to talk right into the mic, like, uh, like one-tenth of an inch away. Uh, any questions? So, 
Well, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll ask one, since uh, um, I, you, you talked about the ammonia derivative. You know, one of the results that led us to propose an additional binding of ammonia was David Vineyard's work that showed that when ammonia binds, it stabilizes the S2 state very significantly with more than 100 millivolt uh, change in the reduction potential of the S2 state. Right. Um, so, Gary, I'm actually, I heard you talk about David Vineyard's work on stabilizing but some of it I didn't hear. Anyway, anyway so the, the one problem with a, a substitution of ammonia for water is that that is not expected to stabilize the S2 state. Right, which you made the point in that original paper. Yeah, so how would you account for that? Um, I don't know that I particularly have a, a good solution to that, Gary. Okay, so there's, there's more work to do. Hello? So, okay, I, 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 I'll just say, it seems like there's more work to do. Okay. <laughs> well, that's why, again, I think we're really, I think getting up in the S3 one step closer is gonna be, <coughs> gonna be very interesting for all of us, so. Okay, well, Dave, we, I think we we'll- We need to work harder. Yeah. <laughs> I, okay, I think we'll sign off, and thank you very much for a really excellent talk. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Holger, for letting me uh, go a little early, and thank you all very much for uh, having me Skype in. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Get to see you for a second. Look at all the fine people there. Okay, take care.